Okay, well, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Sue Reif. I'm the field trip chairperson for Colorado Field Ornithologists. I want to welcome you to this uh, event tonight, the Birding Skills Workshop with Nick Comer uh, giving a gall workshop. We have a few um, announcements before we get rolling here. Uh, first of all, on the screen, you should see CFO events, save the date. We've got a fantastic uh, speaker coming in, Arvind Punjabi, with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies on March 21st. Uh, it's, I got to see some of his photos and talk to him a little bit about this project, and it's really interesting. I think you'll find it uh, really uh, something that you want to catch. Nick, do you know what time that starts? 7 p.m. 7 p.m., great. Uh, and then next that we have is our first annual Colorado Birding Challenge. It's on Saturday, May 8th, which also is the big day for birding. And uh, there's a ton of information on uh, cobirds.org. But um, I think the next slide talks about a little bit about the Colorado Birding Challenge. It's to help support grassland bird conservation. We're trying to get enough teams to have uh, at least one team in every county in the state. Uh, so far, I think we have, uh, I don't know, 13, 14 counties represented. We're trying to kick that off and get a few more counties represented this year. Uh, the goal is to collect data, collect and uh, see as many birds as we can in a 24 hour period. Uh, to put all that information on eBird checklists, so that way we can uh, help eBird get a lot of data on one day in as many counties in Colorado as possible. Uh, teams are two to four people. And as you can see on the slide, ABA big day rules apply. And you can go to American Birding Association and, and uh, check those out if you're not familiar with what those are. We have five categories this year for participation. Uh, you can be in an automobile group like me, or we're gonna drive to Grand County with our team and uh, drive from spot to spot. Uh, you can be a green team like Nick Komar is doing a green team in Jackson County where they're gonna drive to Jackson County and then uh, bicycle and walk around. Is that true, Nick? Yep. All right, we've got a youth category, a group, uh, category of photo and audio. So you need to get a photo or an audio recording of every bird to count. And then a non-competition um, category. Um, your score is big day total divided by the county handicap. On the CFO website uh, has the, uh, how many birds that uh, species you might expect to see in the county that particular day. Uh, and then there were gonna be um, awards uh, one award uh, per, per team to, to uh, get money donated to a, a conservation group. And uh, let's see here. Individuals and non-competing teams are welcome. And you're going to be raising funds through donations uh, per species or they're just, you know, give you $10 for as many birds as you see, that kind of thing. But a lot more information can be found on cobirds.org about that. Sign up, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be fun. Okay, um, also upcoming, we have a few uh, Zoom workshops as part of our birding skills workshop series. We're happy to announce March 28th at seven o'clock, our own Ted Floyd is gonna do an eBird uh, presentation, starting eBird uh, and how to get going on it, how to feel comfortable. He's gonna answer questions because all the bird checklists that we want you to do on the big day, we want you to do them on eBird. So this is a way to make sure everybody out there can do an eBird checklist. And then uh, a newly announced workshop on April 25th at seven o'clock with Nathan Peeplo on using audio and how to record with your phone, how to edit and attach it to different uh, checklists and things like that. Free registration as always. Okay, we're almost done with the announcements. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, to participate in the birding challenge, you need to be a um, CFO member. 
Um, if you're a CFO member, it's free, it's free to participate. If you're not a CFO member, it's a $50 fee. But as you can see on this benefits of membership at the bottom, uh, membership for CFO for the year is only $25. So you get to save, um, save some money if you join CFO, get a lot of benefits there. Early sign up for convention field trips, quarterly field trips, um, Western Field Ornithologist discounted membership, um, lots and lots of stuff. We had a, a great, uh, uh, let's see, a publication that we put out that Peter Burke is working on right now. It's uh, always fantastic. Okay, so those are some of the uh, upcoming events. And without further ado, I want to introduce Nick Komar. He is not only our CFO president right now, but um, just a little bit about him. He Sue, grew up on the Yeah. Uh, David Hill has a couple of announcements to make as oh, well. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, David. Fire when ready, my friend. Dave, okay. Go ahead and share, share your screen. <clears throat> yeah. Well, uh, Sue has to uh, stop. Okay. I'll stop as soon as I figure out how to stop. Just a second. And uh, let's see here. David, I'm not sure how to stop sharing my screen. Okay. David, if you, could, <laughs> if you go ahead and share your screen, it should work. All right. All right. All right. Portion. Yes. Okay. Great. There we go. Fantastic. Great. Thanks, Nick. You bet. Hi, I'm Dave Hill. I'm, pre I'm currently president of the Denver Field Ornithologists. And uh, I just wanted to share a couple uh, of our programs uh, uh, coming up. The, uh, we have a program March 8th from two of our grant recipients. And uh, uh, on the 22nd, we will, uh, uh, we will have Sherry Williamson presenting on hummingbirds. On April 5th, Richard Crossley, author of uh, several field ID guides, will uh, be presenting. Uh, on April 5th, he'll be presenting on waterfowls in his, his, uh, his book. He's also got a new upcoming book that he will promo at that time, at that time too. Uh, and our fourth program for the season is a a April 19th um, by Brian Horente. And uh, he's a meteorologist with a, a National Weather Service, and uh, he's going to present on going birding in the right bad weather. Yeah. I also want to pr uh, uh, just promo Hawk Watch at Dinosaur Ridge. It's just started. It's a citizen science project. It, uh, its first day is March 1st. We've had an informational meeting and an orientational outing Saturday, but if you're interested, please contact me. My email is davidhill2357 at gmail.com. You can also reach me on the uh, CFO or dfobirds.org website. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for allowing me to announce. And David, will these presentations be offered on Zoom? Uh, yes, they're all Zoom presentations. And uh, to uh, register, it's real easy. Just go to the dfobirds.org. On the home page, you'll see programs and events. Click on that, and then you can select the program you want to register. It's right there on our on our website. Thanks so much, David. Boy, those sound interesting. I'm going to sign up for sure. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, let's get back to uh, the gentleman of the evening, Nick Komar. I want to introduce him. Um, he's from the East Coast where he fell in love with gulls, uh, studying and looking and photographing. He moved out here in 97 uh, uh, as a biologist for the Centers of Disease Control, where he specializes in uh, the ecology and surveillance of West Nile virus and birds. Um, he has 230 publications and 11,000 cit uh, uh, citations of his work. So he's an amazing guy. Not only he's a president, our president, uh, but um, he's out in the field a lot and you'll really enjoy spending time with him in the field. So without ado further ado, I'd like to introduce Nick Omar. Take it away, Nick. Okay, thank you very much, Sue. 
And I see we've got a large crowd tonight. 191 people are in this meeting. That's exciting. Um, okay, so my, I'm talking on goal identification, and this, has, this will have a Colorado perspective. I'm going to advance the slides here. Let's see how does that work? Hmm. There we go. Okay, um, so uh, most of the photos you'll see tonight are mine, but there are a few from other people. So I just wanted to get the photo credits out in, in, in the front and in case I forget later. There they are. Uh, and uh, tonight, the agenda will start off, I'll start off reviewing some reference materials and then uh, have some general statements on gull identification, uh, review field marks and status of Colorado gull species, discuss identification of hybrids, contemplate a few mystery gulls, review some classic ID challenges with side-by-side -side comparisons, and have a discussion with all of you in and all that in 90 minutes, if you can believe that. So uh, we're talking about reference materials. And of course, in this uh, uh, digital day and age, uh, everybody likes to, to work online. And there are some websites that are very useful for people learning gull identification. Uh, one of them is the North American Gulls Facebook page. It's got over 10,000 members, and it's a community of people who, who love to who love to discuss anything related to gulls. So if you see some interesting gulls, you can put your photos up there and ask questions or discuss other people's gull issues and questions. It's a, it's a great learning experience uh, to follow that Facebook page. Uh, that Facebook page is, was created by Amar Ayash, one of our uh, national experts on gull identification. He's got a, a blog called Anything Laris, which you could check out. Uh, there's a great um, website in Europe with tons of information about gull identification, mainly with, from a European perspective. Uh, there's eBird. Um, there's lots, you know, thousands of photos of all types of gull species on eBird. So that's a way to learn about gulls. And the Merlin app is very useful for people who want to uh, get an opinion about what the photograph that they took of a particular gull is. None of these uh, are perfect um, sources of information for identifying every gull, but uh, they will be useful. And there are many other sites as well, but this is just a, a, a list of some useful sites. And uh, some people like to learn by looking at videos. There are some videos available on gull identification. Uh, two videos that were produced in the la at the end of the last century uh, one is the large gulls of North America. The other is the small gulls of North America. They were produced by John Vanderpool, who lives in Colorado. And um, uh, they, they are highly, uh, they've, they've, uh, they, they've, they've received very positive reviews. And then there's some uh, reference books, which I, I recommend to everybody. Uh, for, to start with is your basic field guide to, to bird identification. And most of the field guides do a fairly good job with gulls, like the National Geographic Guide, for example. My favorite field guide for gull identification is, is the Sibley Guide to Birds. Uh, I just think that he, David Sibley does a really good job of, of uh, drawing uh, gulls. And um, he's got, I think, 10 or 11 or 12 depictions of each gull species on a page, so he really covers all the different plumages very well. Um, but the field guides don't go into great detail, and, and some of these other books uh, do a much better job of, of uh, describing the, the various plumages, the various molts, molt cycles, um, similar species, uh, hybrid, hy hybrids that occur in different species. And these other books have lots of photographs as well. So <clears throat> the four major book research reference books are, is um, first one I have here is from 2004, Gulls of Europe, Asia, and North America by Cl 
Klaus Malling Olsen and Hans Larsen. Hans Larsen does the um, illustrations. And the nice thing about this book is it, 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 it provides both illustrations like David Sibley's book, but also photographs of all, the, all, all these gulls. And these are Northern Hemisphere gulls. Each one of these books sort of has a different approach to gull identification. Uh, like this, uh, Gulls of Europe, Asia, and North America only deals with the Northern Hemisphere. Gulls of the Americas by Howell and, and Dunn came out in 2007, only deals with the Western Hemisphere. So uh, there's some Northern Hemisphere gulls in Asia that aren't in this book. Um, and, but this book does include the South American species, whereas the uh, other book does not. So, and then Gulls Simplified, uh, which just came out in 2018. Um, this only focuses on North American gulls. Um, so it's a little bit um, more focused in that sense. Um, and it's based on photographs mainly. Uh, so it doesn't have the, uh, the illustrations. And then Gulls of the World in 2019 is a great photographic guide to all the gulls of the whole world. So that's it's the most complete guide so far, um, but it doesn't have illustrations. It's, it was sort of designed to be a photographic uh, supplement to the 2004 book by Olson. Um, <clears throat> so and each of the books brings something new or something different to gull identification. Uh, for example, this gull simplified um, has a different approach. It, it not only discusses um, feather by feather uh, differences in plumage, um, but it also uh, talks about the overall uh, sort of jizz of a bird, um, the general impression you get. So I think that's what they mean by gull simplified. That you don't need to necessarily know every feather. Um, and they've got this nice spread where they have every species compared uh, on, one, on one spread page. And so that's useful. And, and they also have another spread where they have the silhouettes. So they're emphasizing to learn the gull shape and, st shape and structure, not, not necessarily worry about the plumage so much. And then all of the gulls have nice uh, diagrams of gull topography where you can learn you know, what, the, what the feathers are called or which part of, of the bird is which. And so this, this, uh, this spread is from Olson's book, uh, Olson and Larson's book. Actually, it's the version before the, the one I presented. This was published, I think, the year before. And while we're, at, while we're on the topic of topography, I will just review some of these feathers uh, because we're going to be discussing, they'll, they'll come up during the course of the, uh, of the presentation. So um, uh, we'll be talking about, well, the primaries. Um, I'll use my arrow here. Here we go. So we're, the primaries, which are the, the, the uh, outer wing feathers, which stick out over the tail. We'll talk about that. Those a lot. We'll talk about the tertials. Uh, these big fat feathers here, which are part of the secondaries. Uh, so the secondaries are, are covered up here by these greater coverts. And uh, then above the greater coverts, you have the median coverts and the lesser coverts on the wing. And then these back feathers that cover up the wing are called scapulars. And those come up a lot. And then the back feathers itself is called the mantle. and the mantle often refers to the, these back feathers and the scapulars. That's also known as the saddle. And then, uh, what else do we have here? Uh, the tarsus refers to the legs. The tail feathers, which are also known as rectrices. And uh, anyway, all these books have uh, these nice uh, diagrams that you can refer to if you need to. And then here's the bird in flight where you have the primaries, these outer 
flight feathers, there's 10 of them. And then the secondaries, which are the inner flight feathers. And the innermost uh, feathers, of the, of the, of that line of feathers are the tertials. And here's the, the rectrices are numbered one through six, going from the center to the outside. Oops, what happened? Okay. So the uh, axillaries are these coverts uh, right where the wing hits the body of the bird. That doesn't come up too often. You don't have to worry about that, actually. OK, so going on, um, these 10 outer primary feathers are numbered P1 through P10. And they, they, when they molt, they molt starting at P1 and then progressively molt. So they drop off the old, the old feathers drop off and the new feathers come in in, in, in this order from P1 to, through P10. And uh, this typical white patch at the end of, on P10 and sometimes on P9 as well is called the mirror. And if you, so some birds have a, a white tip of the, of the primaries. Like, so look at P7, it's got a white tip. It's got a black subterminal bar. And then usually there's some white there called a moon. And for example, slaty back gulls have really big moons there. And then you have the base of the feather, which is gray, and that's called the tongue. That comes up sometimes. Okay, so these so these uh, the greater coverts cover up the secondaries, and then the, the coverts that cover up the primaries are the are the greater primary coverts. Okay, and then we talk about the eye color, which is uh, based on the color of the iris. And the orbital ring sometimes is important for birds in breeding plumage. And the gape can be important, the gape color. And then this spot on the lower mandible is called the gonis or gonidial spot or gonis spot. All right, so uh, there's some other features of the Olson and Larson books that I really like. One is this um, comparison of, of wingtip patterns for the adult birds. Um, all these gulls have slightly different patterns of black and white and gray in the, in the tips of the wing when, when they're fully adult. And there's actually, uh, there's variation within each species as well, but so this book actually has four different spreads uh, comparing wingtips. And then uh, it's got a couple of spread spreads here uh, comparing illustrations of all of the adult birds in basic plumage. So you see which ones have brown streaking and, and spotting on the head and which ones don't and how much of the brown spotting they have in, in non-breeding plumage. And then, uh, um, so going back to that, you can see the different shades of gray on all of these birds from very pale gray to very dark gray. And then the Howell and Dunn book, they don't have a comparison like that, but they do have a table that lists the uh, Kodak grayscale value for, and the range of values for each species. So for example, on this table here, ivory gull, which is an all white bird, has a Kodak grayscale of zero. Uh, and then the darkest one is Olrog's gull from South America, which has a Kodak grayscale of 15 to 17. Okay, so. Um, and I mentioned that this is a, this is a, a a diagram of, of um, illustrations from Olson and Larson's book. And like Sibley, he, he puts down many different images or illustrations of one species all on one page. So this is the herring gull. And he's got uh, 12 different 
versions of Herringal on one page uh, in the standing position. He's got another page where he's got about that many in the flying position. So these, these books go into great detail, um, comparing all the different types of plumages that you might come across in a herring gull. So you know, people wonder why gulls are so difficult to identify. It's because they um, molt through uh, various plumages to get to adult plumage. And, and uh, for example, the herring gull molts through 11 different plumages in its first four years of life uh, to reach adult plumage. So it's a little bit more complicated than, for example, a blue jay or a scarlet tanager, which only has a few, you know, a couple of plumages. So that's part of the, um, the challenge of gull identification. Not to mention that many of these gulls, when they go through these immature plumages, they, all, they, they, they look very similar to each other. And that's what we will spend the rest of our time discussing, I think. So um, as we talk about immature plumages, we need to discuss briefly age nomenclature. Uh, because it, knowing a gull's age is very important to its identification. So there are three categories of gulls in terms of how long it takes them to mature. Uh, and those categories are two-year gulls, three-year gulls, and four-year gulls. And the, the number of years refers to the period of immaturity in the plumage. So a two-year gull uh, takes two years to get through immature plumages to its adult, to its adult plumage. Three-year gull takes three years to get through immature plumages, and four-year gull takes four years to get to adult plumage. So examples of each of those categories, Bonaparte's gull and Franklin's gull are two years gulls. For example, ring-billed and new gulls are three-year gulls. California herring and lesser black-backed are all four-year gulls. Um, the, the molt cycles. So every gull goes through two molts per year. The first molt is a complete molt, um, meaning it molts all of its feathers. There might be some exceptions, but um, it's fairly complete molt. Uh, actually, did I say that right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So the, the first, so that first molt per year. The second molt per year is a. Uh, incomplete molt. It only molts the body feathers, not the flight feathers. So flight feathers only molt once per year. Body feathers molt twice. So, and we, we refer to the, the annual cycle of molts as, as um, one cycle. So first cycle birds can be birds in their first molt or their second molt, but it's all part of the first annual cycle. So first cycle birds include juvenile birds in juvenile plumage, birds in first basic plumage. The first basic plumage is also refers to first non-breeding plumage or first winter plumage, and first alternate plumage, which is also first uh, breeding plumage or um, uh, or first summer plumage. And then second cycle birds. And the second annual cycle of molt. And uh, third cycle will be in the third annual cycle of molt. And each cycle gets closer and closer to, to adult plumage. Okay, so now one thing to be aware of. When, when I use the term 2CY, I'm saying that means second cycle. But 2CY in European nomenclature for gull, people working with gulls, refers to second calendar year. And that can be different from second cycle. And uh, banders um, who need to use official codes for, for aging gulls, uh, they use SY to refer to second year. And that and second year actually also means second calendar year. So a bird that's born in the summertime in June 
uh, in December turns six months old and it's in its first cycle and its first calendar year and it's considered a hatch year bird by banders. On January 1st of that first year, now it's six months and one day old, it becomes a second cycle, a uh, second calendar year bird. And it's now in its, it's now aged as SY, second calendar year by banders. But it's still a first cycle bird. And it will be a first cycle bird until it initiates its second annual cycle the following June. I hope that was clear to everybody. <laughs> Uh, if not, you might have to go back and listen to it again in the recording later. This, this is being recorded. Okay, so moving on. Um, we have 21 species of gulls that have occurred in Colorado, and this is uh, this is actually a um, uh, a bar chart from eBird that shows the 21 species of gulls and their um, their, their abundance status and seasonality of occurrence in the state of Colorado. Uh, also, there have been six hybrids that have been reported in the state of Colorado and eBird. I'll discuss what they are later, but from this bar chart, we can see which species are common, which species are uh, here year round, for example. So the most common bird, I'll use my arrow here, the most common uh, gull is the ring-billed gull, and it's found year-round in Colorado. So we'll start off by familiarizing ourselves with the ring-billed gull, and then we can compare everything to that to, to see if it's something different. Okay, so. Um, okay, so in the past, people have asked me, can you make a chart where you know where you just look up on the chart what what the species is based on what you see, and uh, I tried doing that, and this is what I came up with. I tried to make it as simple as possible. Here's the 21 species on the left, various categories of of uh, plumage, uh, size and structure, um, bill color, eye color, leg color. Uh, and also the status of the bird, you know, whether it's abundant or common, or rare or uncommon or vagrant. And this might be helpful to some people, especially beginners, just to get a sense of what they're looking at, but I don't find this very helpful to me. Uh, for one thing, this, this particular chart right here, uh, this is based on breeding plumage adult gulls. So you could have this chart and it'll help you identify uh, what you're looking at, if it's, if it's a breeding plumage adult. But some of the, these birds aren't even found here during the breeding season. They're only found here in the non-breeding season. So that's one issue. And then the other issue is that this doesn't deal with the immature plumages, which are the most difficult plumages to, to differentiate. So uh, you can feel free to, to uh, copy this chart and you try using it, but I don't think it's going to be very helpful. And uh, bottom line is you just need to go out and learn as much as you can about the gulls that are found here and so that you can recognize uh, what you're looking at. So I'll, I'll discuss briefly what my approach to gull identification is. Um, first of all, familiar, familiarize yourself with the common species. So as I mentioned, ring-billed gull is the most common uh, gull in Colorado and it's found year round. Uh, so the first thing to do is to, to pick out birds that look different from ring-billed gulls. So the second point is to scan flocks for what the unusual birds in the flock. Unusual can mean you know different size compared to ring-billed gulls, different color. But maybe he has a black back instead of a pale gray back. Uh, maybe he has a black head instead of a white head. And then um, characterize the differences you find in the unusual birds in terms of size, shape, and structure, and morphology, which, which refers to what, how, how the bird looks. So make, you know, 
evaluate its plumage. What you know, what colors are the feathers? What, what what patterns are the feathers? What's the color of the legs? What's the color of the feet? Uh, what's the color and pattern on the bill? Uh, what color are the irides? Irides refers to the it's plural of iris, which is the uh, eye color. Um, if it's breeding plumage and you can see the orbital, check out the color of the orbital and the gape. Those can be important in, during breeding plumage. The orbital is, is the, uh, the tiny feathers around the eye. Okay, and then document anything that looks unusual. Uh, best way to document birds is, is with photographs. Uh, photograph every angle you can and try to get every feather of the bird, uh, every body part. Uh, video can be very useful for documentation. If you don't have a camera, you can take field notes, include sketches if possible. Um, even audio recordings can be helpful for identifying some of these gulls. And then once you've got your documentation, you can consult references, like the field guides we discussed, the textbooks we discussed, and discuss your findings with other colleagues or friends who are, who are birders or more experienced with gull identification than you are. And you can put your photographs onto Merlin and get an opinion from Merlin as to the identification of the bird. You could put your um, photographs on eBird and even you know, select the species that you think it is. If you're wrong, for one thing, eBird will tell you if it's an unusual species in your area. And if it's a rare species, it will require a comment. So that, that'll sort of flag what's, what's rare and what's not rare in case you weren't aware of it. And if, you, if it turns out that you, uh, once you see that it's rare and you double check your identification, you, you're convinced that, you, that it's a, a rare bird, the eBird reviewer might contact you and, and discuss it with you. Um, bottom line is getting feedback can help you learn to be a better birder and, and uh, become aware of the mistakes that you're making and make corrections. So I encourage you to share your findings with the birding community. Um, there are many ways to do that in addition to what I've already mentioned. For example, you can post it to your birding listserv or put it on Facebook. Photos on Facebook is a great way to get feedback. You can put it on the North American Gulls Facebook page where 10,000 other gull enthusiasts might uh, enter into a conversation with you. Um, and uh, so if, if with photos, um, sometimes one way to, to handle photos or videos, for example, is to post them to a website and then post the link to the photos on the discussion uh, site. So for example, I've done this on pbase.com. I have lots of goal pictures in my, in my pbase.com site, including many that, I've, that I haven't been able to identify. So I've got dozens and dozens of, of mystery gulls that I've got sets of photographs of on, on that website. So you can look at some of those if you're interested and help me figure out what they are. Okay, moving on. Something's not working. Well, you know what? Uh, why don't we take a one minute break in case it's um, need to get a drink or something. I'll try to figure out what's wrong with my computer. Just try to stop sharing and then reshare. Okay.
Everything was going so smoothly. Let me try that one more time. There we go. Okay. All right. So hopefully you're back from getting your drink. And uh, so just some general comments about gull finding or gull, search, gull birding uh, with the focus on gulls. First of all, you have to be able to find the gulls. So uh, gulls have certain habits and they tend to congregate in certain places. Uh, and if you can figure out where they're hanging out and, and learn their, 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 um, their routines, then you can, uh, uh, it'll, it'll make your life easier in finding the ones you're looking for anyway. Um, so, um, for example, gulls love reservoirs, and we have a lot of reservoirs in Colorado. So uh, some of you might recognize this reservoir as, as uh, Pueblo Reservoir. This is the South Marina tires at Pueblo Reservoir. And that massive black-backed gull right there is the great black-backed gull that is always there every year. It's been coming back for 30 years approximately. So now the gulls, are, they're not feeding there. They're hanging out. So they need a place to hang out and rest. It's safe for them. So. Um, and when they're not hanging out there, they might be feeding at the local uh, landfill or rubbish dump. That's one place to find a lot of gulls. Or they might be, um, there might be other food sources. Uh, for example, you find ring-billed gulls around parking lots uh, where there's um, fast food places or picnic areas. Uh, and now, if you wanted to get a gull to come towards you, to get closer to it, um, you might consider doing what people do on, on pelagic birding trips. They want the seabirds to come in close and they put out chum. They put out you know, fish parts. And uh, you could try that in Colorado, that might work. Uh, this is a bird that came close to me on, on the ice at, at, at a local lake because I threw a cracker out and it, it came to investigate the cracker. Uh, it's not a good idea to feed wildlife uh, processed foods like this, but on occasion, if you need to get a bird to come in closer, that might be one way to do it. Um, now, gulls like to eat fish as well. So um, this is an example of a great gulling spot that just it's sort of a temporary spot that came that became active recently uh, last month because the local gravel pit was draining the water. So it created a mud flat with a lot of dead fish and that attracted many gulls. So uh, there's always a gull, there's always a lake being drained somewhere. And if, if you can figure out where the lakes, the drained lakes are, then you can find some great gull, gull observing opportunities. Um, now I've seen other lakes that have dead fish or fish die-offs where they're not, it's not due to draining the lake. It might be due to some other um, biological phenomenon that causes the, the fish to die. But uh, that would be a good place to see gulls. And uh, if there are mergansers or golden eye on the lake, they bring either fish or other um, food stuffs like, um, um, crawdads, crayfish, up to the surface, and gulls love that too. And the gulls will steal the food from the, the, the golden eyes. 
winter roosts, uh, so gulls roost communally at night. Uh, unfortunately, they're often very far away at these sites, and the, in a, and the lighting conditions are not ideal for good observations. This is uh, at uh, um, in Boulder, outside of Boulder, um, but lots of gulls, but hard to see. Okay, so now I'm going to go through each of the gulls and briefly talk about what they look like. And I'll start off with ring-billed gull. So there's four common species of gulls in Colorado. The ring-billed gull, the, Col the California gull, the herring gull, and the Franklin gull. <clears throat> and we'll also mention the status of each bird. So ring-billed gull, uh, it's, a, it's abundant throughout the year in Colorado, but it doesn't breed in Colorado. And this map shows the breeding area in pink. The closest breeding sites are in Wyoming. Um, but there's always some non-breeding individuals that will stay in the wintering site here in Colorado throughout the, throughout the summer. So the definitive adult, it, it's, this is a medium-sized gull um, with a, a pale gray mantle, uh, extensive black in the wingtips with two or sometimes one large white mirror in the, in the primaries. And the bill is a yellow bill with a black ring around uh, the end of it. It's got a yellow eye and yellow legs. Immature stages. Uh, this is a three-year gull, so um, the first uh, the first cycle birds uh, already have some gray coming into the into the uh, the mantle, um, and uh, the, the first cycles have a, a, a thin tail band. And second cycle on the bottom left here. Uh, this bill is becoming yellow, but the, the black goes, the, instead of having a black ring around the, the, the end, it's got a black, the entire end, is, the entire tip is black. So it's got more black than an adult would have. And it hasn't developed its yellow eye yet either. This is a first summer bird. This here bird's in its second year of life. So this bird uh, here with the wings spread already has a ring around the bill. Still has a dark eye, uh, and it now has uh, lost most of the brown in the wings. So the wings are now gray, but it's got extra black in, in the uh, greater primary coverts and these median coverts. All that black, these black feathers in the coverts get lost in the, the adult bird. And these black outer primaries don't have any white tips on them yet. So this is a second cycle bird entirely black primaries. And then this bird here would be a third cycle. So third cycles either look like full adults or they've got some element of immaturity. So in this case, the element of immaturity is that the eye is not quite full yellow and these white tips in the, in the primaries are not large enough. So this is sub-adult. And here's fully adult birds. In this case, they only have one mirror on the, on the outer primary instead of two. Here's a three different age classes all flying overhead at the landfill on January 9th, 2016. You got the first cycle birds on the right uh, with the thin tail band um, and a lot of brown in the wings. It's got a gray back. You can't see that though. Second cycle has a thinner tail band and now the wings are fully gray, except for the black, since the black in the wingtip, but lacking the white mirror. And then you've got the definitive adult plumage. You've got the white mirror in the outermost primary. So um, gulls live to about 30 years old or so. And all the gulls three years older, older, older look like full adults. So that's why you see so many adults in these flocks and, and smaller numbers of immatures. And you're going to see uh, more first-year birds and second-year birds because some of the first-year birds uh, don't survive uh, to their second year.
Okay, so here's a bunch of non-breeding uh, alternate plumage birds. So it's the breeding season. Uh, all the adult birds have left Colorado. They've all gone north, but here's a large flock of in sub adult immatures that are hanging out in the summertime. May 19th, from a gull's perspective, is summertime. It's just before the breeding, the high peak breeding season at, at their, uh, their nest areas. This is a Cobb Lake in, in Larimer County in Colorado. Can California gull. This is the only gull that breeds in Colorado. It breeds at three or four different communal roost sites. I mean, communal um, nest colony sites. Um, there's actually two different subspecies of California gull. One that, that breeds north of the border in Canada and one that breeds south of the border. Um, the one that breeds north of the border is known as the Alberta gull. And it's slightly different than our California gulls that breed in Colorado. It's a paler, larger bird. And I, I won't have time to discuss it, but they do occasionally show up in Colorado during migration season. So California gull, uh, this nest was photographed out in Weld County. Uh, here's a couple of chicks. Uh, the chicks grow up quickly at the nesting colony. And in juvenile plumage here, on the right-hand side, this brown bird looks like a, a, a immature, uh, it could be an immature herring gull, it could be an immature Iceland gull, it's, it could be a lot of things. Um, but they lose that black beak very quickly. And by, their, by the time they show up away from the nesting site, they, uh, they have a bicolored bill here. So here's a first cycle uh, hatch year California gull, this brown bird here with black wing tips. This is a dark individual and they sort of come in two, two uh, versions, dark and light. Uh, and these other birds are ring-billed gulls and California gull. They have uh, pink legs just like herring gulls. And here's some immature plumages. California gull is a four-year gull. So this is a second cycle bird with the gray coming in on the mantle. Uh, it, it still has a bicolored bill. Its leg color is, uh, loses its pink and becomes sort of bluish. And here's a third cycle bird where the, the wings are no longer brown, they're gray, but the, the wing tips don't have the white tips in them yet. This third cycle bird uh, now has um, has retained its black tail. Some third cycles lose their black tail, but some third cycles retain their black tails, which make them look like a black-tailed gull from Japan, which is kind of interesting. But we've never had a black-tailed gull in Colorado yet. Uh, and then if, uh, this is probably a fourth cycle bird. Uh, this bird looks like a full adult except that it's got a ring around the bill, like a ring-billed gull, instead of a red, red gonis go, spot. So it tells you it's still a sub-adult bird. It's got a dark eye, because California gulls have dark eyes. A, a third cycle or fourth cycle herring gull would have a yellow eye. And it still has this bluish tint to the, to the, to the legs. Here's a definitive adult, non-breeding California gull. It's, because it's in the it's in the winter it's in winter plumage, with the streaking on the head, um, it hasn't developed its yellow legs yet. So in breeding plumage, it will develop yellow legs, and uh, a bigger red spot next to the black spot on the bill. And I think we've got some pictures here. So here's some California gulls in breeding plumage. This red spot gets bigger. It gets so big sometimes that the black almost entirely disappears, but that's usually only on the breeding uh, on the breeding grounds. And also, you can see in breeding plumage, it's got it loses all the um, brown streaking on the head. So there's a nice clean white head. It's got this dark eye, and it's got so it's like a uh, uh, eyeliner, red eyeliner, and red lipstick on the gape. 
And these are uh, all breeding plumage, definitive adult California gulls. And look how extensive the black in the wingtip is. It's even more extensive than ring-billed gull. The gray is a darker gray than ring-billed gull. And it's got this large mirror on the outer primary and a smaller mirror on the P9, the ninth primary, right next to the 10th primary. <clears throat> okay, going on. So Franklin's gull is a common species in Colorado. It actually can be extremely abundant in, during migration where you can have flocks of 10,000 birds even in a flock. Um, these are birds of the prairie potholes. They nest north of us, mostly in Canada. Um, they're a bird of the interior United States, not a bird of the coasts, but they winter along the Pacific coast of South America. So they are a coastal bird in South America. Um, and they migrate between South America and Canada. But interestingly, they spend most of their time, I think, in places like Colorado and Kansas and Nebraska. They just love it out here in, the, in our fields. Um, so they're bird of the prairie. Um, here's a juvenile, which we do see in the middle of the summer because the juveniles leave their nesting sites uh, as early as they can in July and come down here to Colorado and hang out for a few months before they travel on to South America. And then, uh, so this would be a second cycle uh, here. Uh, the second cycle, the second all, this second year summer plumage. So it looks like a breeding plumage bird. It's got a black head, but it doesn't have the white uh, tips of the, the primaries yet. And here, this bird does have the white tips of the primaries, but lacks the black head. So this is an adult bird, but in non-breeding plumage. They still have a hooded look to them. And here's an adult bird in breeding plumage with that pink wash to the breast, one of the most beautiful gulls in my mind. That pink is just delightful. Especially when you see a big flock of them like this. These are with California gulls. This is in uh, Horseshoe Lake during, I think it was in April. Pretty common sight. And then this is a, uh, May 5th, 2019, so it's spring migration. Big flock of uh, black-headed uh, Franklin skulls. And there's this interesting bird here, which is, a, it looks like it's the same shape and size as the Franklin skull. Instead of a black head, it's got a gray head. Instead of the dark gray mantle, it's got this really pale whitish mantle. I think this is just a color variant, or basically an abnormal bird, like a leucistic bird. But it's interesting because there's a species in South America called the gray hooded gull that has a gray hood just like this. And the gray hooded gull has occurred in the United States on once or, once or twice. Um, this, I don't think this is a gray hooded gull because it's too small. Gray hooded gulls are about the size of laughing gulls, which are bigger than Franklin's gulls. Uh, and the pattern on the wing is a little bit different, but it could be a hybrid with the gray hooded gull. Or, or it could just be a, a color um, variant of the Franklin's gull. The American herring gull is a common bird. It's here in the wintertime only. It doesn't breed in, in uh, around us at all. It breeds up in the, uh, the Arctic area and the boreal area, boreal lakes and coastal areas of the Arctic. So herring gulls, um, this is the American herring gull, which is different than the European herring gulls. There's several species of, there's several subspecies of herring gull in Europe. And uh, many of them have recently been, been determined to be their own species. And it may be that eventually the American herring gull will be recognized as being a separate species from all these European and Asian herring gulls. In fact, the, uh, the Europeans already feel that way, um, but the Americans have not come around to that yet. So um, 
the herring gull is a very variable taxon, meaning it uh, its plumages can be quite extreme. Uh, um, you can have birds the same age that look quite different from each other. So anyway, this is a juvenile here where the scapulars are, have these big dark areas with the white edge and they become more patterned in their, in their later molts. So here's, here's one that's the first, first um, basic plumage. It's no longer in juvenile plumage. The scapulars have changed and they now have a variety of patterns. Um, these are large gulls, they're very brown, black bill, very black wingtips and, and black tail, pink legs. Uh, these are all first cycle birds. And here you see the tail is mostly dark with some pale base, the outer rectrices. And you've got this rump, which is uh, spotted brown, but not white. So you don't have a lot of contrast between the, the rump and the tail. Um, other species have more contrast there. And you've got this pale window in the outer wing. This pale window is, is caused by pale inner primaries compared to dark outer primaries. So that's important. Okay, so uh, here's some older immature Herring gulls, second cycle, you start to get gray in the, in the mantle here. And the bill starts to pale. It's no longer a black bill, now it's a dark bill, a light bill with a dark tip. Oops, let's go back. Okay, here's a third cycle bird where the gray is now going into the wing coverts, but there's still brown in the wing covert, in the, in the wing, in, still some brown coverts in the wing. The, uh, brown flight feathers in the wing, and the bill is not fully adult yet. The, the underside is whiter, but not as white as an adult would be. Here's another third cycle. Um, this third cycle has small white tips of the primaries, but I can tell it's the third cycle because it still has brown in the wing. And then this bird will be a definitive adult and basic plumage, basic because, so basic means non-breeding because it's got streaks on the head. A breeding plumage bird would have an all white head. And now this adult bird has a yellow bill with a red gonis, or gonidial spot, it's got pink legs. And she had pale yellow eyes, yeah, there's a pale eye right there. Uh, the orbital color is unique in herring gulls, it's yellow, but you can't really see it. And the reality is I don't talk much about orbitals because in reality, it's very hard to see the orbitals. Okay, so here's another look at a herring gull, first cycle bird, uh, black wing tips, uh, very dark tertials, darker than the rest of the body. Uh, the, the, the patterning on these scapulars is, is a little bit different than the juvenile. Pattern, so this is first basic bird. Um, this is photographed in April. April. By April, most of the herring gulls have, their heads are turning white and it still has a dark bill. But not all of them do. Some of them lose their dark bills. Here's the second cycle, just reviewing these cycles again. Uh, this one has lost the dark bill because it's in its second year of life is April 14th, 2020. So it's actually molting into alternate plumage now. So it's lost its streak on the head. It's got a very white head and very white on the breast. Uh, it's got a gray coming in on the wing, on the mantle. These greater coverts have, have faded. So they've lost their marbling and it's got very black uh, primaries. Here's a, uh, Possibly still subadult herring gull. It's almost fully adult plumage. It's got the white tips of the dark primaries. Um, the eye looks like it's yellow. Yeah, it is. It's got a yellow bill with a red and black mark. So the black mark can either indicate immaturity, which would make this a fourth cycle gull, not quite fully adult. 
Some fourth cycle, fourth, some gulls in their fourth cycle would be adult, and other other herring gulls might have one or two traits that indicate immaturity still, which which would indicate that it's a fourth cycle, not older. Um, or I think some older adults can develop that gray mark on the bill in, in when they're not in non-breeding condition. So that, that could just indicate that it's not fully in breeding plumage yet. <clears throat> okay, so we've covered the common species. If you can master the common species, you can look through a flock of common gulls and pick out the ones that don't belong. And that's how you find uncommon and rare gulls. So we'll now review the uncommon gulls in Colorado. So uh, uncommon meaning they're regular, but present in low numbers, not hundreds, but maybe tens or dozens or, or just a handful of birds in location. So the first one we'll talk about is Bonaparte's gull, which breeds in the boreal forests. It, it breeds and it makes nests in trees. Uh, and it's a very small gull. It's a sort of a turn like gull with a very thin bill acrobatic flyer um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it, in breeding season it's got a black head but in non-breeding season it, it loses the black head it still has a black ear mark it's got the thin black bill it's got red red or pink feet and legs uh, I don't have an immature photograph unfortunately but immatures have a black M across their wings and a black uh, the M's, I, it's like a, it's an underlined M. So the trailing edge of the, the wing is also dark. Um, the underside of the primaries here are, are, is white. That's important because a similar species, the black-headed gull has black primaries there. That's one way you tell them apart. And they've got these white, this leading edge of the primary, the outer wing is white. That's very unique black tips of the feathers. Okay, the next piece is Sabine's gull, which people think of as being a rare bird, but it's not as rare as, as you might think. There's, um, you can see up to a dozen of them in a single location during migration in Colorado. Uh, so, and they, there's probably 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 of them reported every year every fall in Colorado. So they're not, they're not that rare. Um, but they are beautiful birds. And the, we think of them as rare because they're normally pelagic birds seen out at sea. So it's very unusual that, it's, it seems unusual that there are birds coming through Colorado. And what happens is I think the birds that are nesting uh, in these northern islands, like the St. Elizabeth Islands, uh, rather than going around the, the continent to go to migrate south, in the Pacific Ocean, they they um, they come straight through the continent, and it's not only in Colorado, but they show up in all these interior states. So it's, they are a beautiful bird. Again, a fairly small bird, small gull, somewhat turn-like in their in their behavior. Uh, the breeding birds have black heads. Uh, the young young birds, non-breeding birds, have have a hooded appearance. Uh, so, and they've got this uh, fascinating white triangle in the wings and, a, and a, a black, thin black line on the tail, the white tail. So very striking plumage, one of my favorite gulls. This is the first cycle here. Actually, this is a juvenile here. And uh, it's got that scaly appearance on the back. And then this is the second cycle here on the right. The second cycle birds look a lot like uh, Franklin's gulls. And if they're in a flock of Franklin's gulls, it can be very difficult to spot them. But you see the, the bill here is black with the yellow tip. That's a typical adult bill pattern on a uh, Sabine skull. So the next uncommon species is lesser black-backed gull which has a fascinating history in Colorado. It, uh, 40 years ago, it was rare, but now it's almost common. Uh, 
Um, you can see in Larimer County in the fall, we typically see up to maybe a dozen or even more than a dozen in certain gull hangouts. Uh, so they've gotten much more common. And I think what's happening is that their breeding populations in Iceland expanded and spilled over into southern Greenland. And these birds are, are began uh, wintering on the coast of uh, the Atlantic coast in the Great Lakes area. And most likely there's even some breeding going on in these islands here, north of Hudson Bay. And those are the birds that are coming down and uh, wintering in Colorado. <clears throat> there's this, another subspecies. So this is the Grail Z subspecies that, that uh, breeds in Iceland and Greenland. There's also the intermediate subspecies that breeds in uh, the Nordic area. And there are other subspecies further east some of which are considered separate species now. The Baltic gull is considered a separate species. It, it breeds here in, uh, in the Baltic Sea and then migrates to the East African coast. And then there's, uh, there's also some Asian uh, forms of lesser black black gull. One of them is called the Huglin's gull that breeds up, up on the north coast here of Siberia and uh, winters in Japan. And some of those have been reported from California. So that's something we have to be on the lookout for. Those are larger uh, black bag gulls with dark eyes. Um, but the, the typical lesser black bag gull that we get is a, is a, is a fairly smallish gull, right, intermediate size. It's bigger than a um, ring-billed gull. And it's got yellow eyes. And the males can get as large as herring gulls. Oops. So this is a typical first or second cycle bird. It's springtime, so it, it may, uh, it might be in first alternate plumage, but it's starting to get some gray on the back, very brown wings, um, really long black wing tips and tail, uh, fully black bill. Here's a, a bird more advanced in its second cycle with a, a darker, uh, more slaty gray mantle. Um, and whiter breast. Its legs are starting to turn yellowish a little bit. They get the yellow legs. This is a third cycle bird. It's got the yellow legs now. Uh, it's got extensive black in the wingtips with black in the coverts, indicating that it's an immature bird. Sometimes third cycles can have uh, dark bills, like this one here is an all dark bill. And, Here's the definitive adult, but it's in basic plumage, indicate, indicated by the, uh, the streaking on the head, which is just a sign of non-breeding bird. Um, but it's got a very large red gonadial spot, which is typical of lesser black bite gull. It's got a yellow eye and yellow legs and a white spot. A very strong contrast between these white tertial crescents, these white bands on the ends of the tertials, and the white spot at the end of the scapular called the white scapular crescent. So because the, they're bright white and the back is so dark, there's good strong contrast there. Whereas the ring-billed gulls don't have that contrast. Uh, they don't have much of a crescent there. Okay. And we'll look at a few more lesser black bite gulls. Uh, this is one from April 18th, 2020. This is the first cycle bird. Um, you can tell because it's got these immature um, scapulars with combination of white and dark in them. So it's not the fully slate gray scapulars of a second cycle or third cycle. And, so, and yet it's not, a, it's not a juvenile either. Juvenile feathers look like juvenile herring gull feathers, big dark feathers with pale edges. So this is this first cycle bird. Um, and here's a second cycle bird with the, um, the tail of the, the uh, lesser black bag is either fully dark or has a dark tail band. This one has a tail band. Strong contrast with the white rump of the second cycle. A really dark gray saddle here and then brown in the wings. Tells us it's the second cycle. Third cycle would have gray in the, in the wings here. Here's a third cycle, the gray from the mantle extends out into the wings. 
but you still have black in the primary coverts, uh, indicating that it's a sub-adult bird. It's also got the dark bill, so it's a sub-adult. Uh, it's losing its dark tail though, so it's starting to have fully white tail feathers. And then a fourth cycle or adult bird um, has fully gray mantle and wings, strong white scapular crescent and, and, and uh, tertial crescent, big white spots on the long black primaries, yellow legs, yellow bill with a big red gonies. It's got a gray smudge on the bill. Now this could be dirt or it could be um, leftover immaturity on the bill, which would indicate this being a fourth cycle bird. It's not quite fully adult yet, but or it could just be dirt, or it could be wintering plumage, uh, an aspect of wintering plumage. So this could this is either fourth cycle or an adult. Okay, so now the next uncommon species is the is the Iceland gull, which uh, it's about as common as uh, lesser blackbird. Now you can have as many as a dozen birds in one place. In the in the uh, range maps here. It shows the breeding of uh, the Thayer subspecies of Iceland gull. So Iceland gull is, has three subspecies. Uh, the western subspecies that breeds in these islands here is the Thayer's gull. And the eastern, sub, eastern North American subspecies, which breeds here um, by north, northeast of Hudson Bay and also the Greenland coast here, is Cumlian's gull. And then, uh, um, and then the, the, the easternmost subspecies is the Iceland gull, uh, breeds in eastern Greenland and a little bit on the southern Greenland coast. But they all winter in Europe, Iceland and Europe. So we, we have two subspecies of this Iceland gull complex. We have the Thayer subspecies and the Cumulian subspecies. And I'll discuss what they look like. So Thayer's Iceland gull looks a lot like herring gulls, but sort of a smaller, paler bird. Um, and the first cycles have dark bills, brown bodies, darker wingtips. Um, but the Tertials tend to be the same color as the body. Whereas in herring gull, these tertials are a little bit darker. Very subtle difference. And slightly smaller bird, rounder head, thinner bill compared to herring gull. These birds are larger than ring-billed gulls. And one way, the best way to identify them is to see the open wing, uh, the spread wing, where you can evaluate the pattern on the outermost primaries. Remember the herring gull had a pale inner primary window and a dark outer primary uh, area creating um, contrast between that dark, out, dark outer primaries and the pale inner window. This on the other hand, the dark on the outer primaries is only on the outer edge of the primary. So it creates a Venetian blind uh, appearance of dark light, dark light, dark light on the spread primaries. That's typical pattern on the Thayer skull. Okay, and now Thayer skulls tend to fade in the springtime. So they get paler with, over time. So the, here's, a, here's the same, here's a similar first cycle gull, but the wing panel is fading. It's becoming whitish. Uh, and also, let's see, the, so on this January 30th bird, these scapulars are still juvenile. They're worn because they've been there for a long time, but they, they uh, still have that very mostly dark inner um, portion. Uh, whereas this one has molted its scapulars and that has pale scapulars with like dark bands. So that's typical of Thayer's gull. They, they molt their scapulars quite late. And the reason they do that is because they breed so much further north. Uh, they breed later in the season as well. So they probably are nesting in July and August as opposed to June and July. Uh, but they've got the darker primaries compared to the tertials. 
and uh, and the spread wing shows the, the Venetian blind even on this paler bird. So here's Thayer's gull. These are older Thayer's gulls or adults. And here here's where we can see how similar they are to herring gulls. Um, but there are several differences. One is that uh, they've got a dark eye instead of a, a pale eye. They uh, have thinner bills, rounder heads. The gray on the mantle is slightly different shade, can be darker than herring gull. The, the white tertial crescent is thicker, and the scapular crescent is thicker. And they, uh, they contrast more with the dark, darker gray mantle compared to herring gull. And these white tips of the primaries are bigger. Uh, considered, so theirs is a, is a dark subspecies of the Iceland gull. The Iceland gull is a white winged gull like glaucus gull. And the further east, they're, they're much whiter. So on the underside of the primaries, uh, here you're seeing the upper side of the one of one wing, but you see the underside of the other wing. You can see the underside of the primaries are mostly pale, right there, where my cursor is. That's typical of a Thayer's gull. So here's another Thayer's gull where, here's the underside of the outer primaries, mostly pale, um, but, you, this is actually darker than usual. Um, and a dark eye. And in this one here, you can see the underside of the, the pale underside of the outer primary very clearly. Bright pink legs, brighter than herring gull. Uh, and here's the, the, the pattern of black on the outer primaries is much less than on the herring gull. Um, <clears throat> And the the, um, the dark tends to be only on half of the feather, not the full feather. So it's sort of remnants of that Venetian blind look on the immatures. Okay, so now we'll talk about the Kumlin's gull a little bit. Kumlin's gull is much rarer than Thayer's gull in, in Colorado. It's about one out of 10 Iceland gulls is a Kumlin's and nine out of 10 Iceland gulls is a Thayer's. <clears throat> so these birds um, are paler than theirs. They're smaller, they have thinner bills. Um, their eyes sometimes are, are pale, pale eyes instead of dark eyes. They have less black on the wingtip. Uh, they can fade more in late spring. So they can look, all, they can look entirely white winged. You can't even see this uh, Venetian blind look on the wingtip anymore. Uh, here's here's some adult. Here's an adult, a very pale adult that was at Boyd Lake, where you can barely see any gray on the wingtip at all. So it's suggestive of glaucous gull here. But if you look carefully, you can see a little bit of gray on the wingtip. And um, they're bigger than ring-billed gulls, but smaller than, than than herring gulls. Sometimes they have bicolored bills in their first year of life, whereas Thayer's gulls always have dark bills. So. If you read up on the AOU checklist, or now the AOS checklist, there's a description of why they decided to split, or they de decided to lump Thayer's gull with Kumlin's gull in the Iceland gull com complex. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip this, but you can go back and look at it on the, on the recorded version. Here's a gull flying overhead that has very little black in the wingtips. And in fact, it looks gray. This is probably a Kumlin's gull flying overhead. But now, subspecies are not full species and you can have intergrades between them. So uh, we're in this interior of the country and the birds that nest due north of us are probably mixes between Kumlin's and Thayer's gull. So a lot of these birds actually look like intergrades. But they have features of both, and this might be one of them. Um, or this could, it's got dark eyes like a Thayer's, and it's got um, very pale gray in the wingtip like a, like a Kumlin's. Here's a second cycle Kumlin's. <clears throat> hmm. 
Uh, second cycle kumlians. Um, so it's going to gray on the on the mantle, um, like an adult bird. Otherwise, it's pale brown, including the wingtips. Uh, it's got mostly dark bill, big big eye. Uh, uh, we think this is a chameleon skull. This is present this this January at Rigdon Reservoir. This could be an integrate between chameleons and thayers. All right, I'm going to move on because we're running out of time here. Um, so rare but regular gulls in Colorado. Glaucus gull, great blackback gull, likely kittiwake mew gull, and little gull. All of these occur every winter, but in maybe less than 10 individuals per species in the state. Uh, some of them, great blackback might be three or four individuals. Glaucus gull might be 10 or 12. Blackback kittiwake could be two or three. Mew gull could be three or four. Little gull. Small numbers, but they're regular. They occur every year. So Glaucus gull breeds up on the Arctic shorelines, uh, and they're very large gulls, very white often. Um, they've got a very pale bill with a dark tip in, in the immature stages, and then later in the first and second year. Third year, they've got a, a gray smudge on the, on the yellow bill, and fourth year, they've got and they've got a red spot, a small red spot. They've got yellow eyes. Uh, they're pretty obvious when you see them. Beautiful pale gray mantle with white tips to the feathers. No gray or black at all. Okay, black leg kittiwake. Um, most of the, so the kittiwakes nest way up high in these Arctic islands, the ones that come through the central part of the country. These are kind of like Sabine skulls, where they're normally pelagic out at sea, but a few of them migrate through the, the interior. And I'm guessing it's these birds here that are nesting on these islands, migrate through the interior. And nine out of 10 individuals that we get are juveniles. And so I, I, I don't have any adults to show you today, but the juveniles are medium sized skulls, smaller than ring build, um, but bigger than Bonaparte's. They've got this black ear spot. Uh, Bill, bigger than Bonaparte's skull, Bill. They've got this black nuchal collar, which is really um, stands out. And they've got a beautiful pattern of gray, dark gray uh, saddle, black and, and pale gray uh, on the wings. So here, here you have like an M shape on the wings, just like Bonaparte's skull, but you don't have the, it's not underlined with black. It's underlined with white. So that's more like a little gull. Mature. <clears throat> These are much larger than little gulls. Uh, they also have a thin black tail band. Uh, mew gull, about the same size as a black lake kittiwake. So it's a, it's a medium sized gull, smaller than ring billed gull. And these breed in the western part of the continent up north in the interior lakes. They come down to the coast in the, in the springtime, in the wintertime. They winter along the west coast of North America. Um, but there are small numbers that, that come through every migration and winter here in Colorado. Uh, they're <coughs> darker mantled than ring-billed gull. So this gray is darker gray than ring-billed. Uh, ring-billed don't have much white in the scapular crescent or the tersal crescent. And what little white they have doesn't uh, contrasts as much with the pale gray of the ring bill's mantle. So, so if you see a small ring bill gull with this obvious scapular and tertial white crescents, probably a mew gull. Mew gull also has more heavily streaked head markings and a smaller bill. So here's, here's a full breeding winter plumage bird that has a little bit of gray on the bill. And here's a uh, non-breeding adult uh, or this might be a second cycle because it doesn't have the black spots on the wing. Uh, and here's a juvenile, all brown. Uh, this is a second cycle here. It's missing the white spots on the ends of the primary, black primaries. Dark eye, thin, unmarked yellow bill. Here's a bird in flight that's got less black on the wingtips compared to the ring-billed gull. 
and bigger white mirrors, thinner wings too. Okay, so great blackback gull is another uncommon but regular gull. And this one's easy, I think, because it's huge. Uh, it's not as dark on the back as other blackback gulls, um, but it's got this jet black primaries and a black bill in its first cycle. And its second cycle has, uh, uh, it can have more black on the, on the back or a bicolored bill. This looks like a, a, this looks like a first cycle actually in flight here. And, oh, sorry about that. Here's a fourth cycle with a black ring around the bill, doesn't have the red spot yet. Pink legs or pinkish legs, big heavy bill, red spot of the definitive adult bird. Here's another definitive adult, massive bill, pink legs, short wings, fairly dark mantle, darker than lesser black-backed gull. And uh, notice the head has very little markings on the head. So. The little gull is tiny, uh, small population, so they're, just, they're not common anywhere. Uh, they breed in these small areas along Hudson Bay and along the St. John's River. Uh, they also breed in Europe. They winter along the Atlantic coast and the Great Lakes, but a few of them tend to overshoot the Great Lakes apparently every year and come to Colorado. Uh, it's quite remarkable. The juvenile plumage is beautiful, uh, dark cap. Uh, I got this photograph by, by canoeing out on uh, Cherry Creek, no, not Cherry Creek, um, Chatfield Reservoir to get close to the bird for the photograph. Here's a second cycle bird, which looks a lot like an adult, but instead of having black underwings, has gray underwings. Um, these dark underwings are sort of unique to little gulls and Ross's gulls. It's got the dark spot on the, behind the eye. Okay, so now we're talking about very rare, but still regular gulls in Colorado. Uh, just one or two uh, show up every year. Lapping gull, glaucous wing gull, and western gull now. Uh, western gull might be considered a vagrant, but that's debatable. Uh, laughing gull is a bird of the, the Gulf of Mexico and, and the coast, southern coasts. But they wander north every once in a while. You might see a first cycle bird, which has a dark brown nape and head. And uh, otherwise, dark gray like a, like a Franklin's gull with black wingtips. Not as much white in the wing as Franklin's gull. Much bigger bill and a bigger bird than Franklin's gull. Here's a second cycle. Uh, this is a two-year gull, so they reach adult plumage by the second year. By the yeah, by the second year, uh, this is the second cycle gull lacks the white tips of an adult. Here's a, a fully adult non-breeding bird with the white tips to the primaries. Um, the white restricted to the ear spot, and the bill is bigger than Franklin's gull. Franklin's gull would have a smaller bill and a hood partial hood. Um, and here's an adult alternate bird or breeding plumage bird with white spots in the primaries. Less white in the wing compared to Franklin's gull, bigger bill, but quite similar otherwise. Glaucous winged gull, large gull of the Pacific, North, North Pacific Ocean, uh, breeds along the coasts, rarely comes inland, but occasionally it does, and uh, when it does, it's impressive. It's a big bird with a dark bill, uniformly colored all, all over the first cycle bird. Second cycle bird is, uh, it's got gray on the wings, on the mantle, um, but it still has a dark bill and dark tail. Uh, third cycle has some white spots on the tips of the primaries, but not as big as, big as, as, a, as an adult bird, and has a, uh, Dark tip to the pale bill. Fourth cycle bird has, looks uh, like, kind of like a herring gull, but instead of having black wing tips, it's got gray wing tips, uh, big white spots on the gray wing tips. The white tertial crescent and scapular crescent right here 
shows up pretty well against that gray mantle. And uh, here's an example of the first cycle glaucus wind gull at Horseshoe Lake in Larimer County, April 22nd, 2020. Very pale uniform gull, small eye. Uh, the bill can look kind of small sometimes, but it's still pretty thick. Um, these are California gulls in the background, and this is probably a ring bill gull right here. Here's an adult lock swing gull from March 3rd, 2020 at Warren Lake. You can see the gray primary, primaries, slightly darker than the mantle, but not much darker. Um, and uh, dark eye, pink legs. Western gull only recently was discovered in Colorado in the last 15 years or so, but it's becoming more, more regular. Uh, one even came and spent the summer in Colorado and had a band on its leg, and we traced the band back to Alcatraz Island in, in California, off the coast of San Francisco, San Francisco Bay. So we know that it, it was about a year and a half old, or a year old when, when it spent the summer in, uh, in uh, Morgan County, in, in Washington County. Uh, here's an adult from Chatfield Reservoir. June 2011, I think this is the first Western gull discovered in Colorado. Um, pink legs, uh, big bill like a gray backpack gull, dark eye. Uh, the gray is not as dark as a uh, gray backpack gull. Black wing tips with white spots. So here's a Western gull. Uh, these are West Coast photographs, but this is a uh, Definitive adult bird on the upper left. Upper right is a first cycle bird, very muddy colored, black bill. But some herring gulls look like this. It can, it can be confusing with immature herring gulls. Uh, here's a second cycle bird with uh, dark gray mantle, brown wings, no white in the primary tip, still has a black tail, uh, pale bill with a black tip. Third cycle bird, Brownish on the wings, um, small spots on the primary tips, uh, yellow bill with missing the red spot of the adult. So <clears throat> here's a, a, a first cycle candidate for a first cycle Western Gulf from Warren Lake, Larimer County this, this year in January. That, uh, I, this never got definitively identified. And when I showed this picture to experts from the West Coast, they, they had their doubts. Uh, so it looks like a Western gull, but maybe it's not a Western gull. Or maybe it is a Western gull. It's, it just goes to show that some of these, these uh, spe rarer species have immature plumages, which are very similar to, to herring gull. And therefore, it can be hard to identify every bird. And I wanted to make that point that you don't have to identify every bird, and, and we should be careful for identifying vagrants if we're not 100% certain. And here's another gull, which I thought looked like a Western gull. Uh, just really dark brown plumage, heavy bill. It's got a little bit of pink base of the lower mandible, which is typical of Western. Slight droop to the bill, uh, kind of muddy color up on the neck, really dark primaries and, and tertials. Um, but I didn't call this one either. So this is, these are just possible gulls that seems like there's one every fall um, that might be a Western gull. And we might be overlooking some of these Western gull immatures. So uh, vagrant gulls in Colorado, Ross's gull, ivory gull, black-headed gull, slay black gull, and kelp gull, all of these have occurred less than five times to our knowledge. Uh, Ross's gull, I think, has occurred three times, ivory gull once. Uh, this is Ross's gull was photographed by Glenn Walbeck at Cherry Creek Reservoir in 2010. Beautiful bird. My, this is my life bird. Thank you, Glenn. This is an ivory gull. Uh, I think it's occurred once in Colorado. An adult bird uh, looks all white like this. A younger bird has black specks. Uh, we'll be lucky to see one in our lifetimes. Black-headed gulls from very common in Europe and in Asia, uh, but not common in Colorado. I think there's only been three records or something like that. Um, but similar to Bonaparte skull, 
Uh, remember, bottom part of the skull has white underneath the outer primaries, whereas black headed gull has black underneath the outer primaries. In slatyback gull, this bird has occurred, I think, three times in Colorado. And I wonder if it's overlooked. But um, it's got bright pink legs. Uh, it's sort of duck shaped. And this white tertial crescent is very thick. And it's got a lot of white on the underside of the primary. So it's, it's an odd combination between a black backed gull and a white winged gull. Uh, it comes from Siberia and western, northwestern Alaska. Um, the, the immature stages look very similar to herring gulls, and therefore we have a hard time identifying first cycle slatyback gulls. But my guess is that some of them are overlooked. Kelp gull, common gull of the South American coasts. Uh, this is actually turned up in Colorado once uh, in Morgan County, and this is uh, Steve Messick's photograph. Really thick bill, dark eye, darker black than a great blackback gull. Uh, yellow legs with a greenish tint, tint to it. This bird then came, came over to Larimer County and spent uh, four or five weeks in Larimer County where it was seen by many Colorado birders in 2003. Uh, and now I'll spend a few minutes talking about hybrid gulls. Um, this is a gull that looks like a herring gull, but it's got these glaucous colored gray wingtips like a glaucous winged gull. It probably is a hybrid between a herring gull and a glaucous winged gull. So in the North Pacific Ocean coastal areas, there's several areas that are known hybridization spots for di different varieties of gulls. So check out this area number four. Uh, this would be uh, hybridization of glaucous winged and American herring gulls. And that's the most common hybrid from this area that would show up in Colorado. So, um, but we, so let me go back. Nelson's gulls, that's glaucous wing, that's glaucous number three. No, that's, there's, uh, it doesn't show it actually. So I'm not sure where glaucous and herring are hybridizing, maybe further east. But glaucous and herring hybridize to form the Nelson's gull. And they show up once, one or two birds per year, so it's fairly common. Uh, this one was from 2020, February, Warren Lake, Fort Collins. It's a large gull, the size of a large herring gull. Maybe larger. It's got a yellow eye, which tells us it's in its second cycle. A pale bill with a dark tip, typical of a glaucous gull's bill. But it's got these darker brown, darker blackish wingtips, uh, which tells us that it's got herring gull heritage. So, uh, Cook Inlet gull is the name of the herring hybrid, hybrids between herring and glaucous wing gulls. These are becoming more and more common. Um, Possibly because there's a hybrid, there's a, a colony where they hybridize in southern British Columbia, it turns out. Um, so, this is a bird from Erie Reservoir in 2009 that looks a lot like a, a Thayer's gull with the uh, Venetian blind pattern in the outer primaries and very pale overall, dark bill. But it was a very heavy, large bird, probably too large to be a Thayer's. So, we think this is. Probably a cook inlet gull. Here's another uh, glaucous wing gull type bird, shape of glaucous wing gull, uniform brown plumage overall, but the primaries are a bit darker. In my mind, too dark to be a pure glaucous wing gull. Uh, and this, this bird is possibly a, a back cross between a glaucous wing gull and a, a cook inlet gull, which makes it look mostly like a, a glaucous wing gull, but still has its darker primaries. So this could be a cook inlet gull as well, but a, not an F1 first generation hybrid, but a second generation hybrid. And <laughs> so I, other, other hybrid mixtures have occurred in Colorado. There's six reported in eBird. Uh, herring cross glaucus, which I just showed you. Herring cross glaucus winged, which I just showed you. Herring cross lesser black backed, which I've seen a few of. Herring cross California gulls, I've seen a couple of those. Ring-billed cross laughing gull, I've seen one of those. And then the other one in eBird is um, the Olympic gull, which is the glaucous winged cross western gull, which is common in the Pacific Northwest. I think it's only occurred or been reported once to eBird. But it's possible that other gull hybrids could occur. Some of them haven't even been discovered yet or recognized yet. 
And here's a, a bird that I think is a candidate for a lesser black-backed hybrid with an Iceland gull. I'm not sure what kind of Iceland gull, maybe a Thayer's gull, maybe a Cummings gull. But this bird is sized like a lesser blackback between the size of a ring-billed gull and, and, and a, and a uh, herring gull here. Uh, and um, it's all dark like a first cycle lesser blackback gull, small bill like a first cycle lesser blackback gull. It's got some significant white spotting on the wings, kind of like a Thayer's gull. Um, but these primaries look too dark to be, and the tail look too dark to be Thayer's gull, in my opinion. This is an adult Thayer's gull right behind it. Uh, and here it has its spread wings, and it, the spread wings show a Thayer's like pattern on the underside of the primaries, where you have a, uh, a Venetian blind effect on those outer primaries. So that makes me think that this could be a uh, hybrid between lesser blackbacked and Iceland gull. And then going back to the comment about some of, the young, some of these young gulls and even older gulls, you can't really determine what they are. Um, they're mystery gulls and, and, and maybe someday we'll figure out what they are, but here I have a couple of examples of mystery gulls to show you. Now, this one looks like a herring gull, but it's got um, more of a tail band than an all dark tail. And the pattern on the uh, scapulars is sort of barred, which is an unusual pattern of, of American herring gull. And it's typical, more typical of European herring gull or Siberian herring gull, which is also known as Vega gull. Uh, so it could be that this is one of these other herring gulls that is just a vagrant to our country or to, to Colorado. Or it might be an, an unusual first cycle American herring gull. You just can't identify it. And then here's another mystery gull that is herring gull size are larger, um, darker gray mantle, dark eye, bill like a glaucous wing gull. It really looks like a glaucous wing gull, uh, except it's got these black primary tips. So this could be a cook inlet gull, or it could be a, one thing that I noticed is that it's got the thick, tertial crescent and thick scapular crescent. Uh, and the, the uh, gray on the mantle is darker than herring gull. So it, it, I thought this might be a vega gull, which uh, is the Siberian herring gull adult. Um, we just don't know. Vega gull has never been documented in Colorado. All right, so I'm gonna end on some comparisons, side-by-side -side comparisons to see what we picked up and uh, to see uh, uh, for better birders now. So here we've got uh, five birds. Some of them have pink legs, some of them have yellow legs. The yellow leg birds are smaller with darker mantles and uh, dark eyes. Whereas the pink leg birds are bigger, pale gray mantled and yellow eyed. So this, these pink large gulls are herring gulls and these uh, yellow leg darker gray gulls are California gulls. Here's uh, three gulls, um, ring bills on the left and right, and then the middle bird is smaller, more dark smudging on the head, smaller bill. Uh, you can see a white tertial crescent and a white scapular crescent that contrasts with the darker gray mantle, slightly darker gray mantle. This is mu gull. These are adults. Here we've got two immature pale white wing gulls, one very large with a pale bill with a dark tip, typical of a glaucous gull, and one smaller with a darker bill and uh, smaller than California gull. So uh, this would be a glaucous gull first cycle compared to Cunglian's Iceland gull first cycle. And here we've got two dark back gulls, one very large, largest gull in the flock, bigger than all these California gulls, and one about the same size as the California gulls, uh, slightly less black on the mantle. So this would be a great black back gull compared to a lesser black back gull. And then we have two small gulls, turn-like, thin bills, uh, one slightly big, bigger than the other, and the smaller one with the dark cap. So this is, uh, I think, a second cycle little gull compared to a 
uh, basic plumage, adult, Bonaparte skull. And with that, I will turn it over to questions and discussion for anybody who still wants to stay on the call. It's now 8.57. This picture was taken at, at Lake McConaughey, which is a great place to see gulls in the wintertime. And this is a joint uh, gull workshop that we CFO did with the Nebraska uh, bird organization last February. <laughs>